Welcome back to Supreme Myths. I am so excited for today's um, episode. With me is Caroline Mala Corbin from the University of Miami Law School. She is the Dean's Distinguished Scholar at the University of Miami. She's a graduate of Harvard College, Columbia Law School, where she had my blogger-in-chief, Mike Dorf, as a professor. We'll get into that at the end. Um, she is one of our country's leading uh, uh, thinkers about religion, and that's why I'm really, and, and originalism, but we're here to talk mostly about religion today. Caroline, welcome so much to the, to the, to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Um, one thing I want to say at the outset, and looking over your, your, your long record, you have the best titles of law review articles of any academic I have ever met in my life. I want to give the people listening and watching just a flavor of a few of the articles you've written. The Supreme Court's Facilitation of White Christian Nationalism. You had me at the. Um, Christian Legislative Prayers and Christian Nationalism. Religious Liberty in a Pandemic, which we'll talk about. And my favorite title of them all, Justice Scalia, The Establishment Clause, and Christian Privilege. So we're going to talk about religion. Um, why don't you just give a very brief introduction to how you view the two religion clauses in the Constitution, your general approach, and then we'll get into more specific math. Okay, so it's good of you to flag the fact that there are actually two distinct provisions in the First Amendment protecting religion. One is the free exercise clause, which directly practices your, uh, directly protects your right to practice your religion. And the other is the establishment clause, which actually indirectly protects your right to practice your religion by requiring some separation between church and state and by um, barring the government from favoring some religions over the others. And uh, both of them, I think, in many ways, work together to protect people's religious exercise. So the free exercise clause, like I'm Jewish, so thanks to the free exercise clause, the government can't ban Hanukkah. And thanks to the establishment clause, the government can't require my son in public school to recite Christian prayers in the morning. Um, having said that, I think the current court is underprotecting the establishment clause or under enforcing the establishment clause and overprotecting free exercise to such an extent that you can even talk about them weaponizing religious liberty. Okay, so that, that's, a, that's excellent. Um, before we get into the, some of your articles and the cases, um, do you have an overarching... So my very first law review article ever when I was at, working at the Department of Justice was about parochial school aid, because I had a parochial school aid case. And I, I was digging deep into kind of the theories of the religion clauses, whether it's religious liberty, religious neutrality. Is there an overarching principle you think both clauses are supposed to further? Um, I, um, I think that if you're, if I had to articulate this, and I don't think I ever really have, is I certainly approach both of them through the lens of equality. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's significant that when the Supreme Court encounters a question dealing with equality among religion and secular, among different religions, it doesn't usually use the Equal Protection Clause it instead relies on the religion clauses in one way or another. Yeah. So that's um, how I tend to think about them. And just in my scholarship, I tend to think about questions of religion versus equality in other areas as well. Oh, that's fascinating. Okay, so let, let, let's get right to my favorite title ever, maybe of a law review article, The Supreme Court's Facilitation of White Christian Nationalism. That's a... I, I, I'm sorry? I have to say, I think I owe Andy Koppelman thanks for that oh, one. Okay. Because I remember presenting an early draft of this at the Law and Religion Roundtable and asking people if they had any recommendations for a title. And it might have been Andy who was like, just, this is what it's about. And I'm like, that pretty much is what it's about. Yes. So so my, my one my one mandatory mention of Judge Posner during, of retired Judge Posner during this podcast will be, he and I once wrote an op-ed for the New York Times about Justice Scalia's theocracy. Um, what do you mean when you say the Supreme Court is facilitating white Christian nationalism? Okay, so um, first I probably should explain what white Christian nationalism yes. is. Please. 
Um, and it's the idea, basically it's the idea that the United States uh, has been, is, and should always be a Christian nation. So it's this idea that the United States has a, a special relationship with God. And in order to stay in God's graces, we really need to embrace Christian values. So as opposed to the Establishment Clause, which argues for a separation of church and state, Christian nationalism believes in the complete overlap of church and state, namely Christianity and the United States. Um, and this is really problematic for a lot of reasons, um, which I'm happy to get into. Sure. And part of my argument is by allowing so much government sponsored Christianity in the United States, the Supreme Court is really bolstering Christian nationalism. So before I'm going to ask you about the, the big cross case the court decided a couple of years ago. And if you before we get into that, I, I do have one preliminary question. Um, I, 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 to be honest, I'm a little flummoxed how to phrase this. The um, Christian conservative law professors that I know who, who might feel differently about the religion clauses than you and I feel, but with reasonable disagreements, um, I think they would argue we do have a Judeo-Christian nation, which is also equally problematic. I'm not suggesting it's not. I think they would put it this way. They would put it that way, that we have a Judeo-Christian heritage. They have put it that way. I've talked to them about it, um, which is not the same thing that you're saying. Do you think they're off on that? Um, I mean, there's no, uh, there's no disagreeing that, historically speaking, many people in the United States have been Christian. Um, but that's different than what Christian nationalists argue, which is that we should continue to self-identify as a Christian nation and only a Christian nation, and that our policy should be shaped by Christianity. I, I guess what I'm asking is, um, and no one has been louder, at least on social media, than I have about white evangelicals and how they're destroying our country as we speak and have been destroying it for a while. Um, I get that when it comes to the evangelicals. I'm not sure I'm on board when it comes to, I guess, other elite, not other. Is, is this somewhat of a class issue? I mean, I don't think you're going to find many public intellectuals saying we need to be a Christian nation. You will find evangelicals saying that all the time. Um, but are there public intellectuals who, who are, and maybe your point is the Supreme Court is doing it for them. I don't know. But I mean, am I being, I don't want to take the side of people I'm not so, phrasing this well. So my argument is not that the Supreme Court are Christian nationalists. Right, right. My argument is that um, there is a Christian nationalist movement in this country, mm -hmm. whoever belongs to it. It's not a small one. Yeah. Um, it has some very problematic attributes to it. Yep. That I, um, and that the Supreme Court is, I mean, is enabling it. Okay. It's yeah. really, yeah. it's my argument by its establishment clause jurisprudence. Okay. I'll just and do... so again, I just want to say about causation, just because I, 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 again, I'm not, causation is always a complicated issue. Sure. And it's never one thing causes another thing. Right. So I, you know, Christian nationalism enables the Supreme Court's decisions, but because causation is not one way, the Supreme Court also in turn facilitates the flourishing of Christian nationalism in the country. And I'm going to ask you about that in about 30 seconds. I just want to quickly plug a friend of mine's book. Sarah Posner is an author, and she wrote a book called Unholy that I reviewed for Dorf on Law um, or someplace. Um, That's fantastic, and I think would support everything you're about to tell us. But let's talk about the Supreme Court. So how is the Supreme Court, through its religion clauses jurisprudence, enabled or made it easier for a white Christian nationalists to send their message across to everybody. Okay, so again, the 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 goal is to have a government that is Christian and a culture that is Christian and a people that are Christian. Right. Um, and the Supreme Court is facilitating that by allowing the government to sponsor Christianity 
in many different ways. And so we see it in all facets of life, whether it is in God we trust on police cars or 10, you know, hundreds of 10 commandment monuments across the country or Christian prayers before government meetings or giant Latin crosses in the <laughs> middle of public highways. Right. And the last two, as you know, are in reference to recent Supreme Court cases that upheld exactly those things. Christian prayers before town government meetings and a Christian Latin monolith on public land. The 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 Gre- the town of Greece case that you're referring to involving two I think it was two years or three years of only Christian prayers beginning a town council in upstate New York. Um, that's what's one of Justice Kagan's, I think, most angry dissents. Uh, you know, she, sometimes she gets it's rare. Sometimes I think she was angry about that one. T- tell tell the people about that, that case. It's really a terrible case. It's a terrible case. Yeah, that's what Kagan said. It's a, it's a really distressing case. Um, so. Again, the backdrop is the Establishment Clause, which is supposed to say, you know what, everyone is better off if church and state do not intermingle, intermingle, right? It's better for religious minorities if the government is not favoring one particular religion. It's better for civil peace because then people are not fighting about it. And it's also better for the favored religion because any time religion gets involved with government, it tends to undermine its integrity. So that's sort of like why we have an establishment clause. And so one of the core precepts is government should not be involved in religious exercises and government should not be favoring one religion over another. All right, that's a lot of the doctrine. The facts were more straightforward. As you said, there was a town in upstate New York They used to start their government meetings with a Pledge of Allegiance. Um, And then they changed it and they started having people from the community come in and give prayers before their town meetings. So before you went before the town board and asked for a zoning variance or something like that, that, that's the kind of meeting it was, right? But those kinds of things happened. They would pray and everyone they invited was Christian and the Christian people they invited gave Christian prayers. And some people who attended the meetings who were not Christian asked them to stop. And I think there are also um, kids. I think I think in that town, there's a requirement that's, that some high school kids go once a year, too, I think, just to add to the pot of bad facts about this case. Yeah. yeah. And, and so they said, you know, having Christian prayers, government Christian prayers before a government meeting violates the establishment clause. And apparently not. The court, <laughs> a court upheld it. <laughs> and the court upheld it. And so now what you have is at the very moment of governance, the government is praying, um, is, is having Christian prayers. And, and actually that is, like that's exactly what Christian nationalists want. Right. Like that is right, right. Christian nationalism in action. Right. The government practicing Christianity. So how do you respond? So I'm going to play devil's advocate for a minute. How do you uh, and I, I don't think the devil is going to have a very good representation, but I'm going to try. Um, so what would you say to people who say, look, yes, it was all Christian prayers, but really our town is almost all Christian. Not all Christian, but almost all Christian. In any event, what is it too much to ask people to just respect for 30 seconds or a minute? Um, this prayer. We're not asking them to, they didn't, weren't forced to pray. They were asked to stand up. They didn't have to stand up. That's a bad fact, I think. But anyway, um, but, but all, all we're asking for is a minute where we just say, yeah, in this room, we're Christians and we're happy about it. Nothing legal is going to come of it. Move on. W- what, what's wrong with that argument? Um, what's wrong with it is it violates the Constitution's <laughs> requirement that church that the government not pray and that the government not favor some religions over others and not everyone is Christian. And the fact that most people are Christian actually makes it worse for the few non-Christians because <laughs> now they're really singled out as not belonging in the same way as everyone else. Yeah. And by the way, I just want to point out some of the problems of Christian nationalism. Um, and, and, and at the very least, and this is really just 
what the establishment clause itself is is meant to prohibit is it, it creates a hierarchy based on religious belief. Um, because remember, the Christian nationalist idea is a Christian nation. But if the a real America is a Christian America, what that means is that real Americans are Christians. Right. Or if you want to flip it, it means that non-Christians are not real Americans. And that's what the Establishment Clause is supposed to prohibit. Make your, make your religious belief affect your standing in the community. And this is not just some, you know, theoretical concern. Public opinion polls find that one out of very one out of every three people in America who were polled said that being Christian was very important to being American. Wow. And like another 20% said it was somewhat important, which means that half the country is walking around thinking that Christianity is somehow a prerequisite for being a real American. <laughs> That's And that is yeah. completely contrary to what America is supposed to be, which is welcoming and including everyone regardless of their Christian beliefs. And, and that's why, uh, one of the reasons why it's so problematic. So you mentioned in God We Trust, um, in the pledge on the coins, wherever, uh, I, I meant the mention of God in the pledge then on, the, on our coins. Um, Justice Brennan, I think, who was a Catholic, I think, uh, but of course a famous liberal, really wrestled with this, you know, for his long career. Um, and I think he once said, and he may have backed off of this, but I don't think so. He would have struck down, there's no question, he would have struck down the, the, the prayers in the Greece case, and he would strike down a lot of things this court allows. But he did say specifically that in God we trust isn't problematic, or at least not unconstitutional, because it's generic. The generic, he called it ceremonial deism, if I remember correctly. Do you have yes. the same issues with non-denominational prayers, non-denominational acknowledgments of a supreme being or beings as you do with specifically Christian, Jewish, or Muslim symbols? Yeah, absolutely. Because right. atheists should have the same rights as everybody else, right? Because not everyone's religion has a God. Right. Right? Right. And some religions have multiple gods, and some have a goddess, and some people are not religious. Right. And it's really not hard to come up with a motto that actually includes everybody without <laughs> regard to their religion. Be nice. In fact, we used to have one, <laughs> right? E pluribus unum, right. out of many, one. Right. And so, um, yes, I do have the same issues with that. I, I think it's, um, now I understand that puts me, I, I have stronger beliefs than many, but I think it, it, it lends itself to the same kind of problem. And let's, let's, um, we're nowhere near done with religion, but let, a, 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 I'm sorry. A, a part of it is like, we're, which sort of goes to show you how the Christian nationalists do have kind of a point, because if we did not have Christianity so embedded in our culture, you know, it would not be possible to have something like that as a motto. Right. Um, I think that, I think that just makes it more problematic. Not less. So let's talk about originalism for a moment. Um, because the the first Supreme Court case about legislative prayers was, was a case called Morris versus Chambers, where the court just said, it, it, we had these at the beginning, we should have them now. No analysis, no tests, no balancing. It was good in 1789, it's good today. Um, however, other originalists have done more work on that. And the argument, in the, those who argue that these kinds of prayers are constitutional always want to go back and talk about George Washington's Thanksgiving proclamation and all this stuff. How do you deal with the originalist who says, we've always had these prayers, there's no, there's no real historical way to say they're unconstitutional? Yeah, so here is where your views and mine, I think, dovetail rather strongly, which I think originalism, um, one of the main selling points of originalism is that it would curtail judicial discretion, mm -hmm. right? Instead of unelected judges making up constitutional rights and imposing their own values on the Constitution, originalism would force judges to, you know, resolve cases in view of the original meeting. And therefore, they would not be imposing their own views on the Constitution. But that's, that's rubbish. Yes. <laughs> um, that's rubbish for a lot of different reasons, right? And, and one of them is 
sometimes the court use originalism and sometimes they don't. So the court was very happy to use an originalist argument with prayers, but you don't see a lot of originalist analysis in the cases involving direct funding to churches that we've seen the Supreme Court yes. recently decide. Suddenly, originalism, right, their view that not a three pence to any church, there, there's no analysis. Um, the other point about originalism, um, as I was just presenting a, a paper about free speech and originalism, and Jack Balkan made the joke that there are, it's like, originalism is like Baskin and Robbins. There are 31 <laughs> different flavors. Yes. It's a family of theories. It's not a theory. It's, and, and I think that, um, I think it's a really, this is a really good example of that. Right, because the originalism they used in this case was one strand of originalism. And as you pointed out, if you use a different strand, right. you might get a different answer. Right. So if you use one strand that's sometimes known as the original expected applications, like how would the founders at the time have applied the establishment clause, maybe you could argue that a prayer to Jesus didn't violate the establishment clause. If you applied a different approach that sort of try to get at the original meaning, the original principle, and the principle is, well, it's okay to have a prayer so long as it includes everybody, <laughs> which a prayer to God at the time would do. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If that's the principle, well, that principle applied to prayers today would actually yield a different answer. And so... I think it's a great like, point. Do you use it? Do yeah. you not use it? Which one do you use? Right. You can always get the answer you want. Yeah. Um, well, and it, therefore, I say the fact that you can construct an originalist argument for this particular outcome is not persuasive to me. And that's not even getting to the point is why should we be interpreting the Establishment Clause to mean the same thing as it did at a time when people were, you know, racist and sexist and anti-Semitic <laughs> and everything else. Right. Like, why is that the time period we necessarily want to turn to to help us decide ambiguous cases? That's such a great answer. And you're so right. You and I see. It's a long answer. But, um, no, it's yeah. a great answer. And you and I do see eye to eye on this issue. Um, and and just, just for people listening, you know, the, in every area of constitutional law, not just religion, but speech, guns, affirmative action, you name it. The justices almost always go back and forth between various different forms of originalism, if at all, as a after-the-fact rationalization for a conclusion already reached, which I assume you agree with in at least 99% of these kinds of cases. I mean, and again, I'm not arguing that it's necessarily consciously manipulative, mm -hmm. but I'm saying that it's very malleable and people are very motivated in their reasoning. Uh, well, because it's funny, I, I, um, I did Rick, Has Rick Hassan last week, and that's going to come out by the time this is pub this is out. Um, but, but he and I were, were talking a lot about cognitive dissonance. Um, and uh, I, I do think some of the justices have that problem while others just act in bad faith. And speaking of bad faith, um, I, I want to make a, a, a kind of complicated doctrinal point um, that I hope the listeners won't get bored by and then get your reaction to it. Justice Kennedy, who wrote the majority opinion in the Greece case, and, and in all of these cases involving religious symbols that you're criticizing, um, there is this idea that it's not a big deal for someone to stand by respectfully and, you know, and, and endure a moment uh, of, of, there's no legal coercion, so to speak, but because of that, it's okay for them to feel like an outsider for a minute or, or something like that in those cases. But then we get the wedding baker who, you know, who, who is being asked to comply with a generally applicable law that had nothing to do with religion, and he's being coerced in some, we're not, we, we, we're not allowed to say to him, you know what, just make the cake. We, we, we know it upsets you, but, you know, it, it, it's you entered commerce. No one forced you to enter commerce and you agreed to abide by a set of rules. And what's the big deal? It's a very different attitude about the wedding baker. Aren't those two things completely opposite? Yeah. So when I, so my first response is one of the things that I have continually tried to push back against is this idea that 
that government sponsored Christianity is simply offensive and people should just suck it up for the moment. Yeah. And part of my point of trying to are explain that like half of Americans now think that Christianity is a prerequisite to citizenship is to show that it's not just offensiveness, right? It shapes our beliefs and values and assumptions about who belongs and who doesn't belong. So again, I, I know I already made that point, but it doesn't often take the first time. Um, and so I think it's worth repeating. I agree. I think we also have a good point as there's a real, um, this may be slightly different than the point you're making. There's a real selective empathy when it comes to um, harms. And I think that there is not that kind of understanding for non-Christians in a way that there is for Christians who make complaints about infringements on their ability to live their life as they would like. You know, I, I often joke on Twitter about Thomas Alito and it's going to be eventually Barrett and Kavanaugh and maybe Gorsuch, probably Gorsuch, um, being the Fox News Five. Um, and, and one of the reasons I say they're the Fox News Five justices is because, you know, Fox News, of course, the war on Christmas, the war on Christianity. These five justices really seem to believe that. I mean, uh, Justice Alito, while the wedding baker wedding cake case was percolating in the lower courts and he knew it was coming to the Supreme Court, he gave public speeches about how Christians are under attack, how, how others, are, you know, he, he used Fox News phrases. I mean, you know, Thomas has done similar things. It's not infuriating. I just want to scream. I mean, it's just terrible. <laughs> um, yeah, so just to the backdrop for everyone, the, the, the baking cases that we both keep referring to is a case, uh, you, you, you probably, listeners are probably all familiar with it, where a baker did, a Christian baker who had a store, a business open to the public, and he made wedding cakes, but he did not want to sell a wedding cake to a same-sex couple on the grounds that it violated his religious opposition to same-sex marriage and argued that he had a religious right to be exempt from anti-discrimination laws that said, hey, if you're a business open to the public, you can't discriminate based on sexual orientation. So that's just the backdrop to yeah. the Baker case. Thank you. And, um, and so it it is, and I um, I think it's an example of um, Christian privilege, <laughs> actually, um, and sort of again, this comes back to your opening about how we have historically been a Christian nation, and I think there's a lot of truth to that, and I think the law has really reflected the beliefs of a certain group of people. Um, and that may be less so nowadays. And so Christians are moving from a really privileged place in society, and I still think they're highly privileged, but they're moving from really unquestioned privileged to occasionally being in a place that's the same as everybody else. <laughs> And I think the loss of privilege is really often experienced as hostility, even though it's not. Um, That's a great so Hold on. I want, to, I want to pause on that line because I think it is so good. Um, the loss of privilege is perceived as hostility. I was listening to somebody this morning, believe it or not, on a sports radio show, but was talking about white privilege and privilege in general. And he was saying that um, for example, uh, people who aren't disabled take that privilege of not being disabled for granted. It's not a criticism of them to say, maybe you should step back and think about how people who are disabled, their lives are so much harder every day. Every day, their life is harder. And that doesn't mean your life isn't hard. It doesn't mean that. But, it's not, but if you're not disabled, it's not hard because you're, not, because you're disabled. And, and that goes to religion and everything else. And I, and I, do, think, I do think that w white Christians in this country perceive equality as hostility. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, I mean, so maybe again, a little explaining of, yeah. of the terms that I'm using, yeah. right? Privilege is generally understood to mean a benefit that you have. I mean, the, the origins, this is really 
critical race theory applied to religion. Oh, oh they're going to cancel and us. I, you can't say that here. They're going to cancel the podcast. Go ahead. Right? And so the idea of white privilege was really those benefits that white people have um, just by virtue of being white. And they're not always bad things, um, like giving being given the benefit of the doubt when they go into a shop that they're not going to steal. Right? right? That's a privilege that white people have. That's not a bad thing. Everybody should have that. Um, but they definitely do have certain benefits. So, um, and, and one of those benefits is being the unstated norm, like being the default assumption. So for example, if you go to the drugstore and you buy band-aids, right? If you're white, you can't see the band-aid, right? The band-aid <laughs> assumption is that you're a white person. Right. Or if you buy nude stockings, well, they're nude if you're a white person. Yeah, I've never done that, by the way. I want to be clear. Go ahead. <laughs> But, you know, that's sort of like just things that you can take for granted, and you're often not even aware of it. Um, and that's true for Christians in this country as well, right? Yeah. Just think about our, our, our calendar is a great example of that, right? Christmas is a national holiday. So Christians have never had to worry about maneuvering their schedule around national holidays in the way that Jews or Muslims, whose holidays fall in the middle of the week, or the weekend, right? Their Sabbath is Saturday or Sunday. That's the weekend. That's not the week in Israel. Like right. in Israel, Friday is off because that's when the Sabbath starts, right? So again, the privilege is like you have certain benefits, one of which is society is structured to make it easy for you. And so I don't think Christians are used to the give and take yeah. that those of us or that, that those of us who are, who are not, are used to, right? We don't right. always get everything we want. We don't get Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur off, right? We don't have Friday off as, you know, part of the weekend. And so, and, and that's obviously true of non-white people if you're thinking about racial privilege. Yeah. But I'm just saying like the rest of us are used to maneuvering in society and understand that it has to be a process of give and take because we have different beliefs and different needs. And I think Christians aren't used to that. Like they're like the only child of religion. Like they're just not used to that in the way that everybody else is. And then when they're finally forced to do it, it can be very difficult. And to really support what you're saying, and most of our listeners will, and will, will know this, but some won't, when, in fact, somebody challenged Sunday closing laws on the grounds that they had it, it required all kinds of adjustments in their life because their Sabbath wasn't Sunday. <laughs> it was, you know, it was a different day. The Supreme Court was completely impervious and, and said, get over it. And it's not that hard. And this wasn't based on religion to begin with, which is a lie, of course, um, and, and so on. So, you know, to the, to the court, it was just normal that Sunday would be the Sabbath. <laughs> didn't even stop to think, well, maybe that's not true for everybody, you know? And again, that's part of privilege is it's very often invisible to those who possess it. Yeah. They're, it just, society is structured for them. So I want to talk just for a few minutes about the Roberts Court um, and religion, because I've written a series of angry blog posts about this, but I haven't gotten out of my system yet. Um, I am writing a piece on Justice Roberts and his hubris, and I think this is an area where his hubris is, is really serious. So just, just if, you, if you bear with me for a minute, when I was at the Department of Justice, we had a case, I was representing the Department of Education because they were being sued for giving assistance to parochial, to religious schools. And at the time, the big issue was what kind of money, support, computers, et cetera, could state, local, and federal governments give to private religious schools? And I litigated that case with the General Counsel for the United States Catholic Conference. Um, and no one in 1990, no one, no one made the argument that there's some kind of free exercise clause right or equal protection clause right for religious schools to be funded by the government if private non-religious schools are funded. No one even thought that. I mean, we're just fighting over, you know, the establishment clause part of it. And then we had this department of Trinity Lutheran and then the Montana case. It made me so mad um, because in that case, the court, go ahead. What did the court do in Montana that, that is so different from yeah. 1990, which wasn't that long ago? <laughs> no, it really was not. Yeah. So traditionally, the religion clause challenge with government funding to religious school was whether or not it violated the establishment clause 
because there's long been a prohibition on direct government funding of religion. It's just something that was the government was not supposed to do because there are a lot of problems that flow from that. I'm sorry, I just want to interrupt real quickly and I'll shut up. I want to point out, people probably don't know this, that feeling is it's at the state level too. That's not like I said, federal liberals in Washington, D.C. Yeah. A lot of states don't want their taxpayer dollars going to religious institutions. Many of them have it in the Constitution. And even if the origins of that are sometimes bad, the, the idea isn't. Keep government away from religion. Go ahead. Sorry. And again, and, and another thing, one of the reasons why has always been this fear that accepting government started if you rely on the government if you become involved in the government it's going to degrade religion and so in fact some of the strongest early supporters of separation of church and state were actually religious people who really worried about the corrupting influence of being connected with the government the, the, the plaintiff and, in my the plaintiff in my parochial school aid case was a devout seventh day adventist who spent his life fighting for the separation of church and state sorry go ahead yeah, no, and I think, again, I think that's a lost aspect of the Establishment Clause, is that it's not only about protecting the equality of the disfavored religions, but that it's also about protecting the integrity of the favored religion. Yes. So that was sort of the more historical understanding of the Establishment Clause vis-a-vis -vis funding of religious schools. But in the most recent cases, we now see an argument that the government's refusal to fund religious schools is a free exercise clause violation. Um, and this is a startling development for those of us who have been in this space for any length of time, um, because, and this is part of what I said at the beginning, where I think the Roberts Court has really been eviscerating the Establishment Clause and aggrandizing the Free Exercise Clause in ways that are really troubling. And so here is an example of the Free Exercise Clause being used in a way quite different from how we used to do it. So some of the, some of the changes we've seen in Free Exercise cases are um, first are the plaintiffs, right? Originally, plaintiffs often were more likely to be religious minorities, mm -hmm. right? Whose holiday wasn't being recognized, right. and they were right. trying to, to get some accommodation so they could celebrate their um, holiday. And they tended to be individuals. Now, what we see is it's not religious minorities, but religious majorities bringing cases, and institutions and corporations bringing cases so now it's not the you know the 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 muslim trying to pray uh to try to satisfy their religious requirements of prayer but now instead it's um corporations like hobby lobby who claim they have religious rights that are being violated are large institutions um so that's one change is who's bringing the case yeah. And I think another change that you really see under the Roberts Court is um, religion being used more as a weapon rather than a shield. Like saying that there, it's not uh, seeking accommodations. Previously, the accommodations tend to be things that really didn't harm third parties. It didn't affect other people. It was just, there was a rule. It was a little thoughtless because people didn't realize how it might affect people who were in Christian or majority religion. And they were trying to find some kind of accommodation. So again, we could all live together. But now what you see are Christians bringing cases that seeking accommodation from things that really do inflict harm on others. So they're seeking a right to refuse to provide certain health care, which is what we saw in Hobby Lobby when you had a large corporation who didn't want to provide preventive contraception, preventive health care to women. Or we see it in the Baker case where we have someone who wants to have a religious right to discriminate against certain groups. Um, so that's a, another um, a, 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 a very um, distressing change yeah and finally bringing it back to your schools is there's um the doctrine currently you know getting back to this equality idea the idea was that you sh 
the the free exercise clause was understood to protect religions from being singled out for discriminatory treatment. Um, and that was the idea that people were intentionally trying to harm religion or religious practices because they were religion. Mm -hmm. But the Roberts Court is expanding the definition of what it means to be discriminated against to such an extent that they're really remaking the entire doctrine. Yeah. Uh, and I think, again, the school cases, like the, the government deciding not to fund religious schools because of establishment clause values is not discrimination against religion. It's a school, it's a government trying to abide by establishment clause yes. values. Yes, yes. I, 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 I want to um, say that Montana case where the court held, I mean, by the way, we're talking about Montana here, not New York, not, you know, not some liberal Northeast. We're talking about Montana. Montana made the decision that it wanted to give some assistance to parents of kids attending secular private schools, but their state constitution forbid them from giving that same assistance to parents who attend, uh, kid, whose kids attend religious schools. And the Supreme Court said that's unconstitutional. A fact that I don't think the court mentions in the case. No, 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 no. It was worse than that. Okay. It was actually worse than that. The Supreme Court in Montana had eliminated the entire funding of private schools. So it wasn't the case that they would fund private secular schools and not private religious schools. They were not funding any private schools. And yet somehow the Supreme Court still saw discrimination against religion in that. Yeah. Um, and but, so, uh, I just want to say uh, the court didn't mention that every private school in Montana was Christian. Back to your original point. Yeah, and indeed, right? The very uh, so um, that's yet another issue, um, and we see that same really expansive understanding of discrimination in the recent cases involving challenges to COVID regulations. Yes. And then I wanted to ask you about that. So we're going to talk religious liberty in the pandemic. Then we'll have to wrap up. But I have one Mike Dorf question at the end. So go ahead. Religion in the pandemic. The floor is yours. <laughs> again. So again, perhaps I'm sorry. Once again, we forgot to mention a basic background background doctrine doctrine that that Eric and I both know is that under the current um, legal rules, a law does not violate the free exercise clause if it's neutral and generally applicable. Right. And so the question is, what makes a law not neutral and generally applicable? And before the Roberts Court, it was understood that it occurred when the government singled out religion for unfavorable treatment just because it was religious. Right. And so the classic case is when a Santeria church was going to open in Hialeah, suddenly the city banned animal sacrifice, which is a sacrament in the church. And they designed the law in such a way that the only kind of animal killing that became illegal was animal sacrifice. And so that was an example of that was a free exercise. by they, they didn't want the religion in their town. They were targeting that yeah. religion. Now, it could be a little broader than that. But again, that's the background assumption of the free exercise clause. But again, that's shifted, right? There's a much more encompassing understanding of what counts as discrimination. And the Montana school case is one example of that. Um, the failure to fund religion is now considered discrimination if you fund a secular counterpart despite the fact that we have an establishment clause that has long been understood to ban the funding of religion. Right. We also see that, as I said, with the, the more recent rulings on challenges to COVID restrictions. So COVID regulations often took the form of something like all like gatherings inside of more than a certain number of people are banned because mass gatherings are often super spreader events and so we are not allowing any of them and included in those would be large indoor worship gatherings and so churches sued claiming that they were being discriminated against 
right? And again, understand the argument is not that it infringed on their ability to practice the religion, because there's no question that's true, right? But these mass gatherings GANs infringed on a lot of different things. Yes. What they had to show is that the worship services were being singled out for worse treatment because they were religious. And that was often a hard thing to prove in all those places that just banned all mass gatherings, secular or religious. And especially in those jurisdictions where they actually made special allowances for religious gatherings in a way that they did not for other mass gatherings. Um, and yet <laughs> the Supreme Court still managed to conclude that there was discrimination against religion in some of those situations and held that those those bans on all mass gatherings inside, um, they held they discriminated against religion. And they did that in a variety of ways that shows how broad their view of discrimination would be. So one, one problem was just bad science. Like they said, well, mass gatherings are the same thing as shopping at a store and you're still allowing people to shop at a store and therefore you're favoring that secular activity over religious activity. And that comparison doesn't work because the risk profile is completely different. But more distressing is their more recent case where they said, if you allow any secular activity that might be comparable, we are going to conclude that you're targeting religion for disfavor. And then strict so scrutiny and then, me, and then strict scrutiny that, applies, right? Yeah, and then strict scrutiny applies. So let me just explain what this means. It means that imagine there are 101 things that are all the same, and one of them are religion and 100 are secular. And in 20 of those cases, the secular activities are treated even more strictly than the religious one. <laughs> right. And then in 79 of them, they're treated exactly the same as religious worship, but there's one secular activity that they might be treating a little more favorably, right? Under that scenario, the court will conclude that the government has discriminated against religion and therefore the COVID regulation will be subject to strict scrutiny and most likely struck down. Yeah, and that's just, and they're doing it not through written opinions after oral arguments, but they're yeah. doing it in the middle of the night. Yes, and that's a whole a separate issue. Yeah. But but what I'm saying is it's a really expansive understanding of what it means to be targeting religious for disfavor when you're treating religion better than a lot of secular activities, right. the same as most secular activities, and maybe not as well as one activity, the court is still going to conclude that's discrimination against religion that triggers strict scrutiny. And, and for those that's people listening, worrisome. listening or watching who are not as familiar as we are with the doctrine, the point about the middle of the night kind of shadow docket opinions is what the court has done this year is inconsistent with a landmark Supreme Court case written by Justice Scalia, of all people, um, that, that said that you don't get to object to generally applicable laws uh, that weren't targeted at religion. Well, no. So, so again, what they're doing is, they ha again, and the, 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 I'm sorry I interrupted It's okay. You. Go ahead. <laughs> is that Eric was about to say this yeah. is a landmark case known as Employment Division versus Smith which established that rule that I mentioned earlier, that there's no free exercise clause violation of a law, a, a neutral and generally applicable law doesn't violate the free exercise clause. They haven't officially overruled that, but they've interpreted neutral in such a way that there are almost no law is going to be able to satisfy it. Because they said, if you treat any secular activity that is arguably comparable to the religious activity more favorably, even if you treat 99 or 9,099 other secular activities equally, they're going to say that's discrimination against religion. And, and, and just this is a, such a scary sentence I'm about to utter. But what this means is that on this issue, the Roberts Court is way to the right of Justice Scalia. And if we focus too much on that, I think our hearts will break. I mean, you know, Scalia wanted to say that the legislature gets to pass generally applicable laws, and if religion is affected but not targeted, then that's just too bad because that's what the— and, and the Roberts Court is taking that 
and saying, no, the legislature has to give special treatment to religion. I call it religious supremacy, which means that this court is to the right of Scalia on this issue. And that's kind of crazy. I mean, who would who would have thought? Right. Um, it does not bode well for the government's attempt to regulate, um, right. uh, to protect our health against um, the pan, uh, and, against uh, the coronavirus. And I'm just going to take a, um, a host privilege for a second and support what you've been saying for the last hour. When I was arguing the Montana case in various places, I ha- so in Montana, as you pointed out, the Montana Supreme Court didn't allow secular private schools to be funded and religious schools not to be funded, they dismantled the whole thing and said, we can't do any of this. And I was arguing, of course, that they didn't have to go that far. They could have just, but it doesn't matter. Law professors, whose names people who listening to this would recognize, said to me, you don't understand what's happening here. The Montana, Montana Supreme Court can't end this program this way in the same way that Virginia in not a city in Virginia, a town in Virginia, in 1963, closed its public schools to avoid desegregation, then gave tuition vouchers to white students to go to private schools. And the Supreme Court said that was unconstitutional, which it obviously was because it just furthered state-sponsored segregation. They were comparing that situation, racial bigots in Virginia deciding to close public schools rather than desegregate them, something we all agree is heinous and impossibly wrong, to Montana deciding, you know what, this is too complicated, it's too much involvement with religion, we're just going to close the whole thing down. Those are very different things. They're not, they're not, go ahead. Of course they're not at all the same, because in Montana, they still had public schools for everybody. Right. And in fact, one of the main motivations behind Montana's bar on the funding of religious schools and is they wanted to make sure that their public schools stayed funded. Yes. Yeah, I know. It, it's okay. Um, all right. Well, this, this has been a fantastic discussion. I could talk to you about religion for the next three hours, but I think our listeners and viewers, or however many they may be, would get bored. So I blog at Dorf on Law. People who know me know that. And I do about once a week. And I've been working very closely with Mike now, Mike Dorf. Uh, for four or five years, and it's been a, one of the great privileges of my career. Uh, he was your professor, I'm I'm told. <laughs> he, was. he was, and he's actually the reason why I am a con law professor today. So a very, uh, if I haven't thanked you already, Mike Dorf, <laughs> thank you. Uh, at graduation, he came up to me and he said, you know, you should really be a con law professor. Wow. And then after I was finishing a stint at the ACLU and I was trying to figure out what to do, he made sure I applied for and got into the Associates at Law program at Columbia Law School, which gave me the time to write and um, go on the market. So um, that's nice to hear. Thank you. It's nice thank to hear. You, and, and uh, <laughs> you know, my, Mike is um, Mike is just a wonderful person. And, and uh he had a wonderful student. I've enjoyed this so much. Thank you so much. And um, I hope we I get to do this more. again. I feel like we're just getting started. I know. Um, I, I, well, actually, what I'm hoping is not in this form. And by format. the way, I just want everyone to understand, I'm actually, um, that is, for those of you trying to figure out if that was the United <laughs> Federation of Planets, it is. I am in my son's room because the internet in my office was working. <laughs> the United Federation of Planets comes from which particular Star Trek spinoff? I don't know, but we definitely started with The Next Generation as our family pandemic viewing. Okay. And we finished that series and we're now on Voyager. So I just, I this is, I swear to God out of my children, this is true. Last night, my wife was reading a book for book club and I was tired. So for the first time ever, I watched the movie where Picard and Kirk actually meet. In, a, in Star Trek Six or something, because I'm the believer that there's been no Star Trek since the original Star Trek series. Um, and my wife likes Picard. And so I watched this whole movie and decided at the end of it that, and I know I'm right about this, and I won't tolerate dissent. There's only one starship captain, and that's Captain Kirk, because William Shatner is a terrible actor and was born to play that role. The guy who plays wow. Picard is a great Shakespearean actor, right? And could have played any role. And I think I rest on You can't have the final word on that. Go ahead. Yeah, clearly that is false. <laughs> um, 
at the moment, I think our household is torn between Picard and Janeway. You're killing me. All right. Thank you so much, Caroline. I had a great time. Really appreciate it. Thanks.